Just waiting until all the pages stop rustling so I know you're there. Okay, 1 Samuel, uh, chapter 1, verse 20. So in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord for him. When the man Elkanah went up with all his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, After the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord, and he will live there always. Do what seems best to you, Elkanah, her husband told her. Stay here until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord make good his word. So the woman stayed at home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. After he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When they had slaughtered the bull, they brought the boy to Eli, uh, to Eli, and she said to him, As surely as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life he shall be given over to the Lord. And he worshipped the Lord there. Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Do not keep talking so proudly or let your mouth speak such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows. And by him deeds are weighed. The bows of the warriors are broken, but those who stumbled are armed with strength. Those who were full hire themselves out for food, but those who were hungry hunger no more. She who was barren has borne seven children, but she who has had many sons pines away. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and has them inherit a throne of honour. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. Upon Upon them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his saints, but the wicked will be silenced in darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be shattered. He will thunder against them from heaven. The uh, the Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the uh, the horn of his anointed. Then Elkanah went home to Ramah. But the boy ministered before the Lord under Eli the priest. Please take a seat, grab a hold of your Bible, turn up page 191, 1 Samuel chapter 1 and 2. 1 Samuel 1 and 2. Make sure you can all see it, it's page 191. I'm going to pray again, I know we've just sung the prayer, let's just do it again. Lord, you don't give us your word merely to fill our time. Lord, you tell us that your word is a lamp and a guide to our path. You've told us that man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. So I pray, Lord, that you would hedge my words to reflect and point to and illuminate and direct our attention and implore us to be doused in your word. Would you help us to do and to think and to feel and to act and to change in accordance with that word that once upon a time said, let there be light and there was and it was good. So do that amongst us, we pray, Lord. By your power, through the Spirit, for good things to happen. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, we began to learn, didn't we, last week that the children of Israel were in their land, but it was a land that was wrecked. It was a land that was barren. It was a land that was full of chaos and calamity. Does that sound familiar to you? And there was a thing that got them there, and it was a thing that prevented them from experience renewal and a reversal of their situation. Can I say that again? There was something that got them there, and there was something that prevented them from experiencing renewal and escape from that calamity and chaos. Do you know what it is? And it's not often I start a sermon this way, but I just want to be so vivid and clear so that nobody can miss this. There is something that I desperately want you to hate. There is something that I don't want you to tolerate. There is something that I want you to shun from your personal heart, from the interactions in your family, from the things that you pursue, from your workplace, from your attitudes. It is the destroyer of lives and the destroyer of nations. It is the thing that caused calamity to enter this world and is the thing that Jesus Christ came to save us from. I just want you to hate this thing. I want you to take it seriously. And the reason I'm having to labour this is because our culture tells us to do the opposite. You're not going to hear anywhere other than from a pulpit and from a Bible open that you need to get rid of this thing. They will say, have more of it. It will make you strong. It will help you overcome. It will deliver you from calamity and catastrophe and chaos. It won't hold you in it. But God's word tells us that this is the root of all ruin of every person you've ever met. It is the thing that keeps you from God's blessing and is the thing that keeps you from God's future for you. It is the thing that will mess up the way you face everything. It is the thing that he wants you to be free of. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's the thing that caused people to enter into sin. It is shaped by sin. It has got such a close relationship to sin. It's pride. Pridefulness. High-handed pridefulness. Do you remember it was the days of the judges? Four times across the back end of that book. The place was run into the ground. There was chaos, calamity and brokenness everywhere. And four times it repeats. There was no king in Israel. And each one did as they saw fit in their own eyes. They acted out of their prideful assumption and decision about what they thought was right, wrong, left and centre. It's whenever we act in that way. Do you remember? I mean, we've been here about Genesis 1. Do you remember in, in Genesis 3, the sa- Satan came along and said, eat, eat, eat. And he goes, we can't do that. God said, we'll die. And the enemy came back and said, you'll not surely die. He's trying to hold back good things. And in that moment, there was the temptation to believe that our words and our perceptions and our desires and our, our way of approaching life will do us more good than God's. And in that moment, it was pride, prideful desire that brought them down. And we're all living in the mess since. And it was the pr- prideful desires of their heart that had crushed this nation and left them absolutely barren. And yet we began a story that reversed that trend last week, didn't we? We picked up on the story of Hannah. And do you remember the story of Hannah? Tell me what she was facing. Go on, shout it out. It's not difficult. What was she facing? She didn't have children and she had an adversary who was making her life a misery, Panina. So not only was she facing this barrenness in a community, in a culture where it was viewed as the worst curse, it was the anti-life, it was to have no future and to not be part of the nation's future. And she was broken as if that wasn't bad enough. She had Panina there every single day, getting in her face and going, ha, 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 di, ha, you're nothing, you're worthless. And in that point of lowness, 
she did the only thing she knew how to. She stood up and she goes to the Lord. But she didn't just merely say, Lord, fix my problem. Take away the chaos, the calamity and the barrenness. She went bigger than that. In that moment of lowness, she was able to see from that vantage point some realities. And she saw two big realities. Reality number one is that when it comes to things, God is big. He is massive. He is the Lord of hosts. And when he is, when we are in a situation to see him as that, everything else begins to be put back in its place. Not least of all, our own ability to be able to fix things that are beyond human help. And from that point of seeing how big he is and how low she was, something of a change. Do you think she was proud in that moment? She was prepared to reach out and ask. But the second thing she did was she just didn't just see how big God was. She saw how big his story of graciousness to his people. Because she cried out in the words of the Exodus, which was a redemption story. She knew and she was basically saying, Lord, remember what you did back then and the way that you've promised to always be for your people. Not just for me, but for the nation that I'm a part of. We're in chaos and calamity. We are beyond human help. There is no answer. There is injustice. There is sadness. There is sorrow. And I'm really sorry I'm speaking so fast you can't take notes on this, Emily. Get the recording and slow it down. (laughs) She was prepared to pray, Lord, do it again. What you did that first time at the Exodus, I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know how redemption's going to work out, but I want my life, my heart to be a part of it. And I even want this child that I'd be tempted to trust as a saviour for me to give me an identity and a security and a standing. I'm even prepared to say, just make any child I have about you and that big story. And from that moment of being laid low, Remember, it was the Lord who closed the womb. It was the Lord who allowed Panina in, into that house. This is a story of how the Lord is going to reverse the results of pride as he humbles his people. If we look at the start of chapter 2, we can see that Hannah gets to tell you about the comings of this baby and how she understood it. And she understood it to be all about the Lord. Look at verse 2, uh, verse 1 there. Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. You can't speak like that out of a textbook. You can only speak it like that if you have had a personal engagement and experience of the Lord coming in and invading your story. And that is what has happened. This is absolutely astronomical. This is beyond what any... If people actually believed that the Lord did this, our building would be chocker right now, wouldn't it? But the reality is, is that people in our state, people on our street, people in our nation really don't believe that the Lord does anything. If he does exist, he's off beyond the Andromeda galaxy twiddling his thumbs. But here's a real woman in real history in a real situation of chaos and calamity. And she's telling a story that has not just changed her future, it has changed her heart. She has had a personal experience of the intervention of God and it has given her a higher view of who the Lord is. You can't expect people to connect with this if they haven't had that experience. This is a unique song and poem of praise that can only be sung by somebody who has experienced the touch of the Lord's grace upon them. Look at what she's left saying. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you. Do you know the sense of exclusivity? There is, he's on this other level. Maybe you've experienced change in your life by the grace of, of the Lord Jesus Christ coming in. And people just don't get why you're so excited about it. Huh? What? Huh? And you just stand in there, you just want to shake them into your experience, don't you? You always feel like your words are never quite enough. 
you know, you try to explain maybe a small part of your testimony story to somebody at work, or you try to make it, or even somebody comes on, why do you go to church? And you're just like, oh boy, oh boy, oh, is that the wrong question they're asking me? I just want to tell them about the, if you could see what I could see, and you want to shake them into what you can see, that's where Hannah is at. She's experienced enemies coming against her. She's had Panina come against her. She's under siege from the Philistines around who are very big and bold and boasting of how they're really awesome. And now what she's doing is she's saying, in that moment when my enemies were coming against me and belittling me and telling me I'm nothing, I am going to boast in this Lord who has come near. It's a strange thing that happens. I mean, many times our our whole culture seems to trade on making ourselves feel bigger and better by putting other people down. We trade on that, don't we? It's the stuff of the school playground. It's the the stuff of social media. It's the stuff of so much. And what does she do with this? She says she doesn't play that game. She steps into a new game. Let them say what they want. But I'm going to boast of the Lord and his kindness to me. I'm going to speak of what he has done and who he is. But what is it that she really rejoices in? It's all about the Lord. But what is it he does? Somebody read for us, please. Verses four through to eight. Somebody uh, verses four through to eight. Somebody read that for us, will you? And in that moment as she says that and makes that declaration, she is giving hope to anybody who's found themselves in a lowly position and has been desperate for a great reversal. Do you see the theme of all of this is that our God is a God who exercises and performs great reversals. And they're done in such a way as to flatten the proud... And lift low the needy who have expressed their need. It's not wrong to arm yourself. It's not wrong to have a business. It's not wrong to have seven kids. It's not wrong to be rich. It's not wrong to sit with princes. But have you noticed that those forms of strength so often become a grounds of personal pride and self-sufficiency. So much so that if you have those things, do you give any time to the Lord? You don't even feel your need of the Lord, do you? And as, as Hannah looks out on her nation, and she looks at the brokenness in the leadership, and she looks at the nations around, she sees all kinds of people who are marching around with swagger because they've got their weapon on their back or their money in their pocket, or their name because they're wearing the right brands, or their list of achievements and they've got more letters after their name than in their name. And they're marching around with a degree of swagger and self-sufficiency. And in that moment of self-sufficiency comes spiritual pride. And we find that the Lord is the God who says that was never supposed to be. That's not what I created you for. That's not how my world was ever supposed to tick. You have corrupted and twisted it. And Hannah was on the receiving end of that. And she knew in some sense she was a part of the problem. But she knew as well it was going to need a great reversal. And so verse 3. Talk no more so very proudly, says the ESV. The NIV we've got in front of uh, us says, do not keep talking so proudly. Or let your mouth speak such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows, and by him deeds are weighed. He's the standard. He's the one we're measured against. 
and so he starts speaking about how there's going to be this re- she starts speaking about how this reversal is going to happen the bows of the mighty are broken but the feeble bind on strength i wonder how many people if they heard that right now and speak would delight in that because they feel oppressed and pushed down by other people proudly and are being made to feel like nothing and they're told sing bold songs or express your anger in this way or cry and yell do something but it doesn't bring anything But there is the opportunity for anybody who will come near the Lord of a future great reversal that begins now and happens later. For those who were full have hired themselves out for bread. There's been a big upheaval in the social order. But those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. The baron who has born seven children, wow! But she who has many children is forlorn. So those who had haven't had that hope of future blessing in, in an inheritance, they've now got seven children, but she who has many children is forlorn. There's going to be a great reversal, and it is the Lord who will administer that. There's going to be a reversal in the nation. There is going to be a reversal in the Lord, uh, sorry, in the world by the Lord. And at this point, you're thinking, if this happens, I need to be on the right side of it. I really do need to be on the right side of it. How do you make sure you're on the right side of it? How does Hannah make sure that her family is on the right side of what's going to be transformed in her nation? How does Hannah, or how does the nation, make sure they're on the right side of what's going to happen in the world? Verse 3, talk no more so very proudly. Do not keep talking so proudly. It's all about your spiritual pride. I thought about that for us and I just thought that we don't talk about this very much, do we? The mark of the people who are part of God's family are that they are very humble and any good thing they have, they don't take credit for, they give it back to the Lord. And they certainly don't walk around with swagger because they recognize that what has been given to them could so easily be taken from them because it's all at his hands. Notice this. She said she wants to emphasize that it's all at, at, at his hands. The Lord kills, verse six, and brings life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. So life and future is all in his hands. It's the thing that people strive for. I need to better control the outcomes of my life and my future, whether it is health or the direction of travel of my life. But we're being told it's the Lord ultimately who has his hand, who controls all these things. Verse 7, the Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. Isn't this all about status? We so often want to give credit to people who who we see are making themselves rich and are exalted. Or those who look poor, we might want to look down upon and say, well, it's their own fault. And clearly, this isn't talking about the removal of moral agency. We do have choices. But at the end of the day, the Lord will sort out what needs being sorted out in the end. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap. To make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honour. In other words, the Lord does as he pleases. Now that should make you incredibly humble, shouldn't it? You don't big yourself up. You don't say, look what I've achieved with all my greatness. Do you remember what happened to Nebuchadnezzar when he did that? He was left eating grass in the dirt like an animal. We have to be so cautious about this. But then I... But then I read it again and I looked down and he says, the Lord kills and brings to life. The Lord, he he brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up from the poor and the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes. And I thought, who's that a picture of? Isn't that a picture of the Lord Jesus? And when he came into the world, he was born into a stable He never owned any property. He never got a degree. He was looked down upon and despised because he was from Nazareth. He was the one of all people who would not be able to save. He went to a cross and as they wandered by in front of him, they said, look at him, he can't even save himself. Why should we listen? 
And the one who was the most shamed and most despised in that moment was saving people and being set up to be exalted. So that though he humbled himself to the place of a servant, the Lord lifted him up, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow. Jesus led the way in this humility and this reversal. And so we come to verse 9. It says, He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. What's the definition of wickedness here? Pride. Pride. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones. Oh, sorry, I'll read it in the NIV. He will guard the feet of his saints, but the wicked will be silenced in darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be shattered. And she rejoices in this and she thinks about the chaos and the calamity that is going on in her world, in her family. And she says, I've been beckoned in to be part of this story. The Lord has granted me the blessing of knowing that my family might have a small part to play in it. I know, in fact, verse 10, there's going to come a king, although there's been no mention of it thus far. I think it's alluded to at the end of chapter 1, where uh, Elkanah comes to her and says, listen, we've got to go and take this child up and fulfill our vows. And she's like, well, I'm going to keep him a little bit longer because I want to prepare him and get him ready. And Elkanah goes, uh, and, and, and it's fine. But he just says, well, as long as the Lord will fulfill his word to us. In other words, there's an expectation that through this miracle baby, Part of salvation will be worked out, not just for her, but for the nation and for the world. And it's going to come in the form of a king. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. And so I jump forward into the New Testament and I think about these powerful, powerful verses that leave me to shudder. Luke chapter 14, verse 11 says this. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted what about that other one god opposes who the proud but gives grace to the humble there is only one you see every other system or every other club or every other religion says this you are in or out by being good or bad do you see that That's the way it works. So if you're good enough, you'll be in. If you're bad, you'll be out. Now, the Bible tells us that we're all bad and we're all part of the chaos and the calamity. So there has to be a new system. What is the new system? It's going to be by his mercy and his grace. Anybody can receive it. Anybody could have it. Whatever your name, wherever you've come from, it is yours and it is available to you because Jesus has made it available to you. But there will be a door. For you to be able to receive it, you've got to be humble. So the kingdom of God is not about being good or being bad. It's about, are you prepared to be humble and receive of God's saving work? Or are you pridefully saying no? Hannah is a model and an example of how to humble yourself so that the Lord will lift you up. And I just shudder to think of how easily I slip into pride. And in those moments, praise the Lord, his word tells me that he opposes me and he will bring me low. I wonder whether you've been brought low in different ways, whether maybe you're lacking in some of the things that are here. Could I encourage you to first and foremost say thank you for that? Because if you had not been brought low, you may be walking around with swagger. And you might never have asked for this great reversal to be enacted by the Lord. I remember the deeply moving and and hugely, hugely humbling experience of listening to Joni Erickson Tata. You remember she, a quadriplegic for many, many decades now, lives life in constant pain. I can't remember the exact phrase she said, but she's experienced what it meant to be laid low. And I could have cited countless examples of this, but it, this was just one personally that was meaningful to me, was listening to her to effectively say, I would never have asked for this being laid low, but I would never be without it. For without it, I would not have been able to sing like Hannah. 
I would not have been able to talk of the sufficiency of God's grace and his reversing power in a way that defies all the acts of the strong and the great and the proud. Here is this Lord. So I wonder whether we can begin to say thank you for some of the things that we haven't got answers for. Why did this have to happen? How, why did it have to play out this way? Why did that element of my life have to be so difficult? Why did that accident have to come? And we don't get any specific answers. But what we get is a sense of a God who uses low things in this world to flatten our pride and to bring good and better things in. So those people who she speaks of, those ones who who were feeble, but now have strength in him. Do you think they would have known that if they hadn't first been feeble? Those who, like Hannah, had never had kids and were desperate and knew the ache and pain of a sense of being utterly dislocated from her purpose in the nation, now that she is able to offer the very thing, that very thing that she wanted the most back to the Lord... And willingly give of that. She knows something that otherwise she would never have known. So cling on to those things. Ask for grace. Nobody is like this, the Lord, who has that level of power, who is so gracious to the lowly and will bring around the great transformation. We've often said here at our church, when you become a believer, you get the most important things fixed straight away. And all things fixed in the end. So you are so rich because before you never had forgiveness. But now you've got forgiveness from a holy God. You never had a place at the table amongst his community. But he has given you a place, a high honoured place. You were spiritually poor, but in Christ you have been made spiritually rich. You were disconnected from his purposes, but now you have been called into his great initiative. And maybe you may struggle with counting the beans in earthly terms. Maybe you may know pain and anguish. Maybe you may feel that things are still out to get you. A day is coming when all of those things will be put right. And you will be in the kingdom of glory through Jesus Christ in his resurrection power. And nobody will lay a charge against you. You will be rich beyond your imagination. Honestly, if I can't believe we not, haven't got whoops right now, people. This, do you believe this is your future? All the things that you have worried about this week will have been reversed. All of them. Nothing will be able to touch you. And all you need to do is be humble and say, I receive. That that is why she is singing. And that is why I want us to rejoice in what she's singing about. We're going to move through this book and we're going to see this gradual movement from chaos to a king. Where the proud are repeatedly laid low and the broken are lifted up. Who would have thought David, the smallest pipsqueak of the family, becomes the king? It's all about the reversals, people. It's all about the Lord making surprising reversals to show his grace to bless all those who are humble and willing to receive. So with that in mind, we're going to sing now. We're going to sing, I will glory in my Redeemer. And as we sing it, be forcing off, be putting off, be battling back all sense of pride. Be praying, Lord, make me to be one who glories in my Redeemer through this week. Help me to rejoice in you, Lord. Help me not to look for worldly strength. That will fail and go by the by sooner or later. Help me to rejoice in you. I hate my pride, Lord, and I will glory in you. Let's stand and sing together.